What's up, dude? Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I don't have anything to preface this video with, so let's just jump right into it. Natalie Holloway was the oldest child of Dave and Elizabeth Holloway, born in Memphis, Tennessee. In 1993, her parents got divorced, so Natalie and her younger brother Matthew were raised by a single mother. In 2000, Elizabeth married George Twitty, who was a prominent businessman. The family then moved to Mountain Brook, Alabama, where in 2005, Natalie graduated um, from the Mountain Brook High School with honors, as well as being a part of the National Honor Society and her school's dance squad. She was a part of a lot of extracurriculars in high school, so you can just tell that it was a really good time for her. She planned on going to the University of Alabama on a full scholarship to pursue a pre-med track. The 124 graduates from the high school went on a five-day unofficial graduation trip to Aruba. The group arrived on Thursday, May 26, 2005, and they had seven chaperones with them as well. And every day the chaperones, one of which was a teacher, would gather up all the graduates and meet up with them at least once a day in the morning typically, just to make sure that they all were accounted for and doing well. The organizer of the trip, Jody Bierman, said the chaperones were not supposed to keep up with their every move and, you know, beings that there's over a hundred plus graduates, how are you supposed to keep up with them, you know? Reportedly, the students partied, drank, and did a lot of room switching every night, so they were really living it up, you know, having a good time. The Holiday Inn informed the group that they wouldn't be welcomed back the next year, so they were having a very nice time. During that trip, there were two mornings where Natalie didn't show up to breakfast because she was so hungover. So now we kind of move into a brief timeline of events that happened in this case. So Natalie spent the night of May 30th out at the Carlos and Charlie's Club in Orangestad. I know I'm gonna say that wrong, but these are like Arubian names. This was the last time that she was seen by classmates like outside of the club at 1.30 a.m. She was driving off in a gray Honda with a group of three boys that were locals there in Aruba. One of the boys was 17-year-old Joran van der Sloot. The first time he spoke out about the events of the night, he claims that he took Natalie back to the hotel, but according to surveillance footage, that never happened. Anyways, Jordan was a Dutch honors student studying at the International School of Aruba, and the other boys were brothers, 21-year-old Deepak Kalpo, who owned the car, and 18-year-old Satish Kalpo. Later in the day of May 30th, Natalie was supposed to be on a flight home later, like that day, but she never showed up for her flight. Immediately after Natalie's parents heard about her missing the flight, no one like knowing where she was, they decided to fly to Aruba to try to find her. They went to the police station right after getting off the private jet and told them everything they knew about Natalie's last sighting. The hotel manager recognized Joran from a surveillance video. Elizabeth and George, along with their friends and police, went to the Vandersloot home and questioned the boys, and initially, Joran denied knowing Natalie, but eventually, he did admit that he knew her and told them the story from that evening, along with Deepak, who, like, corroborated his story as well. Jordan said that they drove Natalie to the California Lighthouse area of Arashai Beach because she had wanted to see some sharks, and then they dropped her off back at the hotel around 2 a.m. He then claimed that as he was driving away, Natalie was approached by a dark man in a black shirt that looked similar to one that the security guards would wear. He also said some other stuff, claiming that like she wanted to sleep with him, but he said no because he didn't have a condom. Just like a lot of really random stuff that didn't quite match up. Hundreds of volunteers from Aruba and the U.S. began search efforts. The surveillance cameras at the hotel weren't functioning quite right the night that Natalie went missing, unfortunately. But when they like were semi-functioning, Joran was never seen on the tapes. Authorities thought that they found blood in Deepak's car when they searched it, but the sample came back as negative for blood. On June 5th, Nick John and Abraham Jones, who were former security guards, were arrested on suspicion of murder and kidnapping. Remember, Joran claimed that the guy that Natalie was seen talking to was wearing a dark shirt like the security guards? 
So I'm sure that's how they came to that conclusion. Authorities have never said why exactly these two men were arrested, but it's suspected that Joran and the Calpo brothers were behind the arrest. Like they said something, you know, like the guy in the dark shirt was talking to Natalie. So they think that like the boys kind of pushed them into arresting these two men. However, they were released eight days later without being charged because there was just lack of evidence. On June 9th, Joran and the Calpo brothers were arrested on suspicion of the kidnapping and murder of Natalie. But by September, all three of them were released released without charges, but on, only on the condition that they remain available to police, like to question them possibly later, they might have more questions for them. Joran would go on to give multiple interviews about what happened that evening. And in 2007, the three guys were all arrested once again, but then released without charges. They were arrested on suspicion of involvement in manslaughter and causing serious bodily harm that resulted in the death of Holloway. Due to lack of evidence though, once again, they were released. In 2008, the case against Joran was reopened after a tape of him describing Natalie's death was released by a Dutch crime reporter. However, locations, names, and times he gave just did not make sense, according to the chief prosecutor. In 2010, Joran allegedly demanded that Elizabeth pay $250,000 in exchange for him to provide her with the location of Natalie's body, and he wanted $25,000 paid up front. So there was a sting operation set up where Elizabeth's attorney met with Joran at an Aruba, Aruba hotel and gave him $10,000 in cash, and then Elizabeth wired $15,000 into his bank account. Then. Joran allegedly changed his story about the night he had been with Natalie. Prosecutor said Joran claimed that he had picked her up, but that she had demanded to be put down. So he threw her to the ground and he said that the teen's head hit a rock and she would, and she was killed instantly by the impact, according to the prosecutors. Then he claimed that his dad buried Natalie's body in the foundation of a house that was about to be poured or built, like the house was gonna be built and he put her in like the wet cement of the foundation. The attorney later emailed Joran that the info he gave was worthless, according to the prosecutors. Within a few days, Joran left for Peru. Two months later and five years to the day of Natalie's disappearance, Joran killed 21 year old college student, Stephanie Flores in Lima, Peru. She was found beaten to death in his hotel room. Joran then fled across the border to Chile, where he was arrested a month later and sent back to Peru to face charges for her murder. The same month he was indicted in the US on federal charges of wire fraud and extortion in connection with the sting back in March with Elizabeth's attorney. An Alabama judge declared Natalie legally dead on January 12th in 2020. 12. Literally the next day, Jordan pled guilty to Stephanie's murder. He was sentenced to 28 years in prison in Peru, and Joran was then going to be extradited from Peru to the U.S., and finally, 11 years later, he was finally extradited to the U.S. on June 8th of this year. Yesterday morning, CNN reported that a judge granted a motion to delay the trial date in the case against Joran in the extortion of Elizabeth. So while they might not be able to get him for the murder of Natalie, cause without a body, without like a murder weapon, it's really hard to um, charge or convict anybody with a murder. So at least they would be able to get him on extortion charges. That's not the justice the family deserves, but at least it is something. Um, I really wish though that this family could get closure for her death. I mean, this happened in 2005 and it's 2023. Like, what is that? 18 years of no answers for the family. I can't imagine how hard it would be for them. So hopefully they get some sort of closure with this, but I am curious to see what you guys think about this, how you feel. Do you think that even with just the extortion charges, some justice is served? Or do you feel like he should be tried for the murder of Natalie Holloway? Leave your thoughts, your feelings in the comments down below, but that'll be it for me today. Thank you guys for watching. If you found this to be interesting, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. If not, thanks for hanging out with me. And for those of you that will be back, I will have another true crime courier video up for you tomorrow. Bye guys.